All right, people. It's time to talk about agriculture. You heard me right. Move on over. Move. Ah, uh, plants and a double pun. Let's do this thing. Greetings and salutations. Unit 5 is pretty sweet. It's all about agriculture. And suddenly, you know, we have a good situation. Coming from an ag school, I think that's pretty rad. And if there are only five units, that means we're in, in an even more rad situation. I'm rambling. Without further ado, here we go. Unit 5. Essentially, it starts out discussing uh, the influencers of what makes good agriculture. So that would be the difference between a physical and a climactic condition. So, for example, a physical environment would be one that has mountains, perhaps has river. Um, a climactic condition would be where you are relative to other places on Earth. So, for example, if you're in the North Pole, obviously it's going to be really cold. Uh, not that there is a physical North Pole. Anyway, the two examples provided in the course exam description are Mediterranean, which would be uh, places such as Italy, right, right along the Mediterranean coast or Southern California or the California coastline, typically common for growing things like uh, grapes, olives, wine. You get the idea. Uh, tropical conditions are terrible for growing things, usually because the soil lacks phosphorus. And a lot of that's because the uh, runoff of rain, just the soil is depleted of nutrients from water running through the soil so much. Um, and you would think tropical soils would be really fertile, and in some ways they are, but kind of difficult and challenging for growing commercial crops. Next we move on to intensive versus extensive. Remember, int intensive is this idea of using more inputs per acre, so more land uh, labor uh, costs relative to the technology you're using. The three examples of intensive farming would be market gardening, plantation, and mixed crop versus livestock. Extensive agriculture would be less inputs per acre. Often on the exam, they're going to go straight to nomadic herding or any sort of cattle ranching, uh, but it could be shifting cultivation. And remember, pro tip, shifting cultivation is also slash and burn. Surprise! So sidebar, we would discuss also the difference between rural settlement patterns and rural survey methods. A settlement pattern refers to this idea of it being clustered. That would be a lot of houses or farms nearby each other. Dispersed would be separated and linear would be in a straight line. It sounds nice. Survey methods, this is where kids get confused because they seem like legalese, but nothing too confusing. We've discussed it ad nauseum, so you should be pretty chill with it. Meets and bounds refers to this idea of a, um, a map based on physical objects. So the border of your land, for example, might be where a river is or a mountain is or a pretty rock. In my case, it would be a sinkhole. Uh, not joking. Township and range is essentially a way to divide a town in a grid pattern, so it's easy to figure out where you live. First street is exactly one block over from Main Street. Second is two blocks over, so on and so forth. A lot of us have this grid pattern. And then long lot is just long skinny lots. Typically there's a river access for trade. And you don't see this so much in the U.S. anymore, except maybe with some new construction neighborhoods. Economic forces, even though development is no longer on the exam for this year, economic forces will be a part of a lot of chapters, so I would expect it to rear its ugly head anyway and just kind of like watch out for that. Subsistence versus commercial. Nowadays, commercial farms are winning. They're growing in number, as you see here. And this breaks down to this question of whether or not monocropping monoculture, the growing of one type of crop, is actually good or bad for the world. It might lead to more access, better quality in that crop, but it also could lead to problems like a specific disease or a fungus which infects the entire uh, herd, for lack of a better term. So we see this example with bananas often in human geography and how we've had to switch from, uh, you know, gross Michel to the Cavendish banana. Not a big deal, but it is, you know, something to watch out for. Intensive versus extensive, you know, one of these is obviously going to be um, harder on the environment depending on the situation, and, you know, they're going to be determined by bid rent theory, which is definitely directly related to von Thunen. The idea is the closer you get to the CBD, the higher the land value is, and therefore you're going to do things that need more land further away from the CBD, because otherwise it'll be way too expensive. Like if you had to buy a thousand acres in the middle of a downtown urban environment to build your farm, that'd be wild and crazy. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Large farms for profit are replacing family farms. Uh, what we're seeing effectively are these complex commodity change chains where countries all across the world are involved in the production of a single item. So they might make the plastic container that your strawberries are in. They might make the label. They might make the, uh, you know, the fertilizer, the pesticide. And so these commodity chains are massive. And that's one of the problems we've seen with toilet paper lately, which is, you know, um, it's been hard to access. And so 
uh, that's probably because world economies have shut down all over the place, including China, where a lot of these paper products are made or bleached or uh, increased scale. We're seeing larger quantities of items being sold, larger carrying capacity of the land. We are able to produce more with less, uh, which is pretty incredible. And a lot of that's due to the most recent green revolution, the third agricultural revolution. Hearths of domestication for plants and animals. Don't forget that sometimes this is called the Neolithic or first agricultural revolution, which took place about 10,000 years ago. And we're talking about the Fertile Crescent, Indus River Valley, Southeast Asia, Central America. You just kind of need to know where they are and that that's where we originate. And a lot of these things originally diffuse from. The diffusion has happened in two main ways. Obviously, there are a lot more nowadays. But originally, through the Columbian Exchange, this is this idea of plants and animals kind of went all over the world after Christopher, the second greatest Christopher. I'm just kidding. I'm definitely not. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, obviously. Um, the, uh, is this idea that all these plants and animals move around the world, like tomatoes, corn, and so on and so forth, after Christopher Columbus shows up in the Americas. It's pretty Eurocentric. I'm not sure it's 100% accurate. Nevertheless, here we are. Uh, agricultural revolution breaks down in three ways. The Neolithic, the second, which is around the time of the Industrial Revolution, plows, you get the idea. And then finally, it's kind of the emergence of commercial ag. The third agricultural revolution would be the Green Revolution, this idea of GMOs and green tech and massive uh, changes to how we produce food, like aquaculture, for example. Impacts would be better diets, we're eating more diverse, larger volumes, more nutritious meals, longer life expectancy, that's an E, I know my handwriting's a bit freakish, and then an increased size of the labor force, meaning we have more people who are capable of working, which is pretty cool. Um, some consequences of this whole deal, uh, there are three ways to break this down. Environmental, which would be, I got a phone call, I know you, you care. Environmental would be pollution, land cover change, meaning we're using the land differently, desertification, the expansion of deserts, soil salinization, that means more salt in the soil, most likely because of desertification or we're literally using too much water, and conservation efforts. Uh, by the way, salinization occurs for a lot of different reasons and, you know, effectively, the more we're using the land, the more likely we're removing nutrients and affecting, you know, climate patterns. Agricultural would be slash and burn. Remember, that's also called shifting cultivation. Terraces, uh, irrigation, which is essentially just how we move water. Deforestation, cutting down trees. Dra draining wetlands. This is what Florida is so famous for. And we tried to do this in South Florida for a very long time, a period of about 50, 60 years. And, you know, nowhere on earth has draining wetlands really effectively produced better agriculture. Societal problems would be changing diets. You know, we're eating different things. The role of women is obviously much more significant than ever before. Uh, women are definitely working more often and in different ways. A lot of the times in agriculture, sometimes in not paid positions, which is not ideal. But if you're eating, that's better than not eating, for example. And we're seeing world economies improve because we're seeing the labor force improve. If twice as many people work, obviously that's going to mean more GDP, more money for families, and, you know, better access to food. Definitely more profit motives for corporations because the economies of scale are so huge, globalization is bigger than it's ever been. And so there's a lot of trade happening, a lot of reasons to make money at the end of the day, but also to, you know, have a snack. The most relevant model of this unit, the agriculture unit, is definitely Von Thun. And that's because it's come up almost every single year, whether in multiple choice or FRQ. It features, it's featured prominently in the course exam descriptions, so we kind of need to nail this thing for test day. Here's how it breaks down. Classic bullseye pattern. It is about transportation costs. So the goal is to minimize transportation costs. And theoretically, if you organize uh, your city such that the farming situation is thus, the agricultural situation is represented this way, this will minimize transportation costs. It has some flaws, but let me break down the good stuff first. Good stuff. If you put ranching on the exterior, then cows have a lot of space, and bid rent theory suggests you need a lot of space at low cost for these cows. Um, remember, they're extensive. Grain needs to be a little bit closer. You can preserve it for a while. It still needs a lot of space, so it should be closer to the exterior. Forest, originally for Von Thunen, you needed the trees to build things for fire, so this model's kind of out of date already. And then closer to the interior, you have dairy, because milk is perishable, remember my favorite term the milkshed. Uh, also market gardens, that'd be things that are super perishable that need to be in those grocery stores. And then finally the central business district or CBD, the place where you purchase these items. The flaws which we need to know and understand are the three following. Specialty crops. They could be anywhere in the Von Thunen model. There's no need for a specialty crop to be anywhere in particular. However, if something 
is grown in a strange way, it's obviously going to have to be in a different location. For example, my clams come from Cedar Key. They're definitely not going to come from Williston for obvious reasons. The physical landscape is clearly not going to be perfectly flat and uh, ideal for a bullseye pattern of every single city. That'd be nuts. We have mountains, rivers, you know, wetlands, and so on and so forth. And then finally, we have modern transportation tech. So our trucks are refrigerated. You know, if we're going to do truck farming and grow some flowers, uh, we can now ship them across the world. They don't have to be, you know, five miles outside of the city center. Things to discuss. Globalization. Oh, also our milk can be, like, dehydrated. Oh, I threw up in my mouth. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Commodity chains are all interconnected, meaning I can buy and sell anywhere on Earth. And, uh, you know, that's pretty cool. It's also kind of dangerous. If there's a, a trade problem or an export economy problem, which we're seeing both of these things occur right now, it's going to mean that the commodity chain breaks down. It's harder to buy stuff. Everybody's kind of sad when they go to the grocery store. We're really excited to just see people. Uh, but we are all dependent on these export economies now. Because the United States is relatively developed, we're importing more than we're exporting. And so the New World Order, which is this idea that the core countries rely on periphery countries and that international division of labor is kind of good for us in that we get cheaper products if they were all exclusively made in the U.S. However, it puts us kind of reliant, in a reliant position on these other export economies. Political relationships, such as a trade war, might be an issue. Infrastructure, that'd be the quality of your roads, your shipping systems, how good are your break of bulk points, that kind of stuff. And then finally, world trade. Uh, challenges in the modern world. Okay, so this is essential that we understand. And I think this is the bread and butter, if you will, of the ag chapter. And here's why. Um, I think these are the most frq questions in the whole section, so we need to really nail this section. GMOs versus monoculture. GMOs are obviously a net good because we're not dead, according to Malthus. We've been able to produce enough food. So access and the quantity of food, our carrying capacity has risen both in population size and food production on land. So those are all good things. Where this is a challenge is we have the rise of fertilizers and pesticides and we're using monocultures. We're also genetically modifying plants and animals in ways we have not before. Do you miss the bell? I do too. And so this has caused a weird situation in that, you know, we're morally in a position where we feel like we need to eat these foods, but they also have this consequence of negative effects as well. Every time I'm biting an apple, I'm also eating a little bit of pesticide. So, you know, it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, food choices. Essentially in the modern world, you know, I can go totally gluten-free. I could be vegan. And that's achievable. This has been a challenge because effectively farmers have to figure out how to brand and market in this new world where everybody has a million preferences, uh, which is cool. So urban farming, people growing from their rooftops, converting old buildings into farms, urban farms, CSAs, this is a community supported agriculture situation. I'll give you an example. Once a week, if you uh, have a farm deliver fresh veggies to your house, I participated in a CSA last week. It was a drive through I paid 35 bucks and picked up 10 vegetables from a local farm. That's a CSA. It's like a subscription service. You get farms from a sp products from a specific farm delivered to you or you pick them up. And uh, it's pretty sweet because you're supporting a local economy, but also hopefully getting better vegetables at a lower cost. Organic would be the, uh, it's kind of a sham label. We'll talk about that later. But organic is this idea that it isn't influenced by GMOs, which is kind of like, uh, in the U.S., that's not a real thing. And then finally, value-added products would be things that improve other products. So, you know, I like my uh, salt and pepper. Fair trade would be a, a label which suggests that everybody in the commodity chain was paid effectively, so we didn't use slave labor. Uh, fair trade, you'll see this a lot in the U.S. on coffee beans because a lot of coffee plantation farms worldwide are a little bit shady. Yeah. I did that. Uh, local movements, eat local movements. This reduces transportation costs, also prevents money from being siphoned away you know, to these huge corporations that probably don't pay taxes or have operations overseas. Access would be insecurity versus food deserts. This was an F FRQ last year. And remember, food deserts affect um, effectively mostly uh, poorer communities and you know, it could even be indigenous communities, could be urban communities. It just means you don't have a grocery store with fresh fruits and vegetables nearby. Uh, distribution networks and the distribution of food, meaning not everybody is able to get that delicious sweet kale that perhaps you are. Weather quality, obviously if you live in a desert 
it's going to affect what kinds of fruits and vegetables you get, what kinds of meat products you get. You know, if you lived in Minnesota 20 years ago, you might not get fresh fruit for literally the entire winter, which is a little bit terrifying. Land use loss because of suburbanization. Every time we get a new, uh, new urbanism type neighborhood on the periphery of a city, we're obviously removing farmland. So that's kind of a, a trade off there as well. Uh, economic problems would be the location of food processing. So that's Alfred Weber's least cost theory. We look at uh, labor, transportation costs, and agglomerations to determine how to maximize or minimize, maximize profit, minimize costs in the location of these places. And then finally, scale versus distribution. How much is for sale? Who has access to it? And then political policies. Obviously, if there's a local sales tax on a specific product, it's going to limit who actually buys it. And so that kind of sums up the whole gist. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And I know that was a lot of rambling. Until we meet again. Mm.